So coming up now is our last keynote of the day. And I'm really excited because anyone who puts geek in their job title is my kind of person. So we're going to be looking at shifting, uh, security, shifting security left while, uh, sorry, shifting security left while building a cloud native bank. So Casper Nissen, lead platform architect, cloud architect, site reliability engineer, and cloud native geek at Lunar Bank, and he's going to be talking about uh, around the topic of you know, when you're building a digital bank, it requires this combination of agility and speed while maintaining really high levels of security. And he's going to share with us the challenges faced and conquered in the process of transitioning from a fintech startup to a bank with its own banking license. Casper, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Fantastic. Wonderful to welcome another geek to the event. <laughs> I always like to meet a geek. I'm a geek about drums and bass guitars, especially. I know way too much about those things. <laughs> and uh, I'm really curious to hear why you call yourselves a, a, a cloud native geek. And I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing about uh, what you've learned on your journey from a startup to a licensed bank. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, so I'll just uh, kick off now. Please. So shifting security left while building a cloud native bank. So as mentioned, my name is Casper. I'm a lead platform architect at Lunar. I'm also a Cloud Native Computing Foundation ambassador, meaning that I do tours, uh, go around uh, the Nordics mainly, uh, talk about uh, Cloud Native and, and sort of spread the word around Cloud Native uh, as this new paradigm. Uh, I co-founded the Cloud Native Nordics, which is a meetup alliance across uh, the Nordic countries where we sort of help each other organize meetups and uh, bring in speakers for interesting events and, and stuff like that. I also uh, organized a local uh, Aarhus uh, meetup around Cloud Native, which is the, Aarhus is the, the city that I live in. So I, I try to be out there and speak at, at conferences and organize meetups and, and, and try to spread around uh, the word of around Cloud Native and what it is and, and help people sort of get into this. So what to expect from this talk? Uh, so yeah, as mentioned, we've been, uh, been been transitioning from being this fintech startup to actually being a, a real bank with our own banking license. So hopefully you'll get some lessons learned in how we sort of approach shifting left and, and how you can stay agile and secure at the same time. Uh, but before going and diving into to that, I'll, I'll just briefly talk a little bit about Lunar, um, what, we, what we actually are. So we were actually founded back in 2015 as Lunar Way, and we are smartphone only challenger bank. We were originally built on top of an existing bank, so, and so to speak, leveraging their banking license. And then back in August 2019, we received our own banking license. And it took half a year or something like that to actually sort of implement the, the, the needed uh, parts to actually go live with the real bank um, in, in the beginning of 2020. We try to be the best in class in terms of UX and support, and we are fully cloud-based, and we are currently present in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. So this is probably a, a bold statement, right? Banks are boring, banks are old. That's how we sort of perceive banks. And uh, from a technical perspective, banks are sort of affiliated with mainframes. At, at least that was uh, my sort of perspective before getting into to the financial world. And we got the chance uh, back in 2015 to actually build a, a 21st century bank. Uh, so how do we actually do that? And with this quote in mind that the only constant in life is change, right? We know things are changing all the time. So we need to build architectures that are sort of uh, embracing uh, change as well. We didn't really do that in the beginning. Uh, as every startup, we built a monolithic application. Uh, startup at some point figured out that was probably not the right way to do it, especially not in Rails. Um, then we migrated into a microservice uh, kind of architecture. Uh, it became a distributed monolith. And now we are at the point where we actually are have, running a, a independent deployable microservice architecture and, and following best practices around domain design and all of that. Um, so I would say we are I finally arrived at the microservice point, which is uh, quite awesome. And also when, when sort of going into this world of distributed and, and building small components, uh, you also need a way to manage them and uh, manage all these components. And, and that's where Cloud Native came into the picture for us. Um, and just to make sure that we are on the same page. So Cloud Native is not the cloud. Uh, 
cloud computing or the cloud is, is often referred to as this on-demand delivery of infrastructure, right? Hardware, services, storage, databases, whatever. Whereas cloud native is more an architecture for assembling all of these different components and sort of in a way that's sort of optimized for your own environment, whether that's the cloud or it's an on-premise solution in your own data centers, uh, cloud can be many things. But one of the main points here is that it's not about the servers anymore. It's more about the services that you're actually running on top of these uh, machines that are the important thing, not uh, the pet machine over in the corner uh, with that specific name, uh, only you know, and only you know how to configure. And Cloud Native Computing Foundation is this organization that tries to sort of um, drive the adoption of this new paradigm. And they have this definition of, as well. It's about running containers, it's microservices, it's building in immutable infrastructure using declarative APIs. And what that actually does is that enable, enable these loosely coupled systems that are resilient, manage manageable, and observable. And the reason for actually doing this is to be able to make high impact changes do that frequently, predictably, and with minimal toil. That's sort of the end goal. That's also why we, we wanted to go down this path because being a startup, you want to be able to move fast and, and get things out there and, and test your ideas and uh, figure out how everything should be built. Then what about security? Because that's sort of from a different world, right? And I, feel, and I think that we need to re re rethink security to some extent, um, especially around application security. Because we have this conundrum, how can we actually be agile and secure at the same time? That's sort of the, the hard thing to, to do. So this is going to be how we sort of approach that. And, and we want to shift lift. So we want our developers to take on more responsibility. And in order to do that, we, we need to do some stuff that I'm going to show you in a, in a bit. But shifting lift, it basically means that we move things that we did later up early. So having this DevOps mindset where we sort of have continuous feedback loops running as early as possible, uh, whether that's going to be testing, whether that's going to be security or whatever it is. In, in this case, it's about security. Because now we have this sort of built this microservice architecture where everything is independent, deployable, and you as a developer are now responsible for what you build. You build it, you run it. That's sort of the mantra. It's no longer the ops department that are deploying your, your things. And, and it's you, you build it and you run it. Also from a security perspective. So let's talk a little bit about how we empower our developers to actually take on that responsibility. And from our point of view, it starts with the onboarding. We, we, we provide a lot of different tooling in, in Lunar from, from this platform team that we have sort of centrally placed in the organization. We provide common tooling, access to systems, and we build security by default into all of these, to, into all of, all of these tools. And we make it easy to do the right thing. That's really important to just make it easy to do the right thing and the secure thing. So there's a lot of some examples here. This is just some of the tooling that you get down on your machine as a developer. You get access to some of the environments and all the stuff that you need and our specific tooling as well that I'll come back to later. But the more important thing is around service development. How do you, as a developer, make uh, or build a service and deploy that in a secure uh, manner? And again, we as a platform team provide all the, the, the sort of the necessary things to actually do that uh, and build security in there. And again, make it easy to do the right thing. We build a tool called Shuttle. It's an abstraction on top of a service repository. So source code is in that repository. And then there's a shuttle.yaml file that points to a specific plan. And a plan is just another uh, Git repository in, in this uh, example. But it's a, it's a repository that we, as a platform team, a security team, sort of manages and, and build all of these best practices into how do you build your Docker files and Kubernetes manifest and pipelines and checks and policies and all that. And you can view this shuttle as this extended uh, make file, distributed make file, so to speak. And uh, I'll show an example. Yeah. But what you get with this shuttle tool is that you get uh, a CLI tool where you can say shuttle run build, shuttle run test, shuttle run security, uh, security scan, and you get uh, yeah, scanning of all your security, all of your dependencies and, and, what, and all the stuff that you need. Um, and I'll come back to an example again later. Um, the file looks something like this. We point to this Git repository, a service. Um, in this case, it's an authentication service. It's owned by Squad NASA. That's our platform team. And then it's basically just a lot of what you need as a developer to, uh, yeah, for your application to, to run and work and whatever stuff you need in there. But the main thing here is it's 
we abstracted a lot of things way, uh, away and we put a lot of security in, in, the, in the things that we now control. And the benefits of that is that we build security in, and I'll come back to the examples, and developers don't really need to care about Docker files and Kubernetes manifest anymore. They don't really need to be experts on that. And also we get a lot of uh, nice uh, sort of cultural thing because we get a lot of inner sourcing on our tooling as well. Um, and then the last thing here is that we can verify all of our stages in a pipeline. We can do that locally, yeah, but that's um, just a, another nice benefit. You can check out the project. It's up at Luna Way uh, Shuttle GitHub organization. Um, it's an open source project that we created. So building security in secure by default. Um, some of the things that we build uh, in is, of course, when we run Docker containers, uh, we don't want to run root users in our Docker containers. Um, we also minimize or use minimal, minimal OSs. So as we are a Go-based shop now, we primarily use the Scratch. It's basically just building a, an image and copy over a binary in a Scratch image. And that's more or less what's in a container for a, sort of from a, an application perspective. And also in terms of Kubernetes, um, we specify this user that we now run in the, in the container. We specify that in, in our deployment manifest as well. We provide service accounts. We don't mount all of these uh, default um, Kubernetes access tokens, and we provide some disruption budgets for availability and, and stuff like that. So we get a lot of things out of the box as a developer, um, which is basically the, the make it easy to do the right thing again. And then you get vulnerability scanning in the pipeline of dependencies. Uh, we use Sneak. Uh, you, we also scan the container images, even though there's not much in them. Uh, we still do have some other stuff that pull things down from the internet, uh, that uh, open source projects that needs to be scanned and, and kept up to date, of course, and patched all the time. So we use Sneak for vulnerability scanning. We have Kubernetes manifest validation in, our, in, in this tool as well, where we can uh, we'll use kubevel for YAML validation. And there's also this tool called conf test, where you can actually apply, uh, set up different policies and have uh, conf test um, use this open policy agent to actually uh, uh, yeah, uh, create policies, which is also really nice. So we empower our developers to make the right decisions. Um, and, and one of the ways we are also do this is that we provide actionable alerts and remediation advice on, on CVEs. This is a, an example of, uh, of a sneak um, CVE uh, where it's really nice as from a developer perspective, you get the information you need. It's fixed in this version. Remediation uh, is this and this and this. It's uh, super easy to see. Sneak is not the only uh, provider of this. You can probably find this in all the tools as well, uh, but this is a really nice uh, sort of perspective from a developer's um, eye. But even more cool thing is if you could actually get this automatically, right? So whenever there's a PR or whenever there's a fix available for a CVE, get that pull request in automatically and just have the test and the pipeline run and have the development version the PR once that is ready. Even better, right? Uh, one of the things that we also do a lot is that we have this continual focus on, on CVEs uh, between the different teams internally. So there's this in, internal competition uh, almost to, to keep uh, the number of uh, high, high CVEs uh, as low as possible. So we have that on a weekly basis, but we also provide our developers on every build with the, the result of the scanning. And we build into uh, this, these results from Sneak, but we built that into our in existing tooling as well. So we use Prometheus and Grafana for monitoring. So we have built an exporter that actually gets the data from Sneak and, and displays the, put it into Prometheus and we can display that into uh, our dashboards that are running and sitting on, on, uh, on different places in the office, which is also really nice. Cool, so that was a bit about application security uh, and how we shift that left. But also from in this process, from being a FinTech to being a real bank, we, we were sort of met with some requirements, of course, uh, audibility, minimize access into environments and also availability is a really important thing being a, a bank, right? And, and we were looking at different solutions and we found GitOps as a solution that could help us uh, in a modern way to actually achieve this. Um, and just to, to be sure we're on the same page, GitOps is about comparing the state of a running system with, the, uh, with a desired state. So you specify a declared desired state somewhere and do that continually. And whenever sort of these two get out of sync, you force the state to converge into the desired state. And if you know are familiar with Kubernetes, reconciliation is the word for that uh, inside of Kubernetes, you specify a desired state. I want five replicas. 
we have five running. Now we have four. The controller manager sees this, and it will just drive the desired state back into whatever is the desired state. So that's a really nice feature to have. And, and GitOps is about doing that on a sort of a broader perspective for the entire cluster. So now you specify the desired state in a cluster or in a, in a Git repository, and you have an, a controller running inside of your environments that is now reconciling the entire environment. Um, and our solution looks something like this. It's, I know this is a, a, a big uh, slide, um, but, but the main thing is that our developers build some stuff, put it into a service repository. We have the CI run, which shell and all that, all the checks and compliance stuff are running in there. The output of that is um, something committed into a, an artifact storage, which is something that it's just Kubernetes YAML. And we have this tool called a release manager that then checks for different policies that we, we need to ensure commits that into a config repo. And then we have the controller, which is Flux in our, Flux in our case, running inside of environment that applies this uh, continuity into the different environments. And then we have some feedback loop to actually get some response back to the developer. And from a developer perspective, we have now put in a Git repository in the middle between uh, you and the, the production environment. So now you have this CLI uh, called hand control. Uh, we are space themed shop. So Ham was the, the, the first chimpanzee in space. So we just thought that was cool. So Ham Control is the, the name of the CLI that we use or our developers use to actually bring stuff into production. So you could say Ham Control release this branch into this environment. Um, that is pretty awesome. It's a really nice way to, to sort of minimize the access from a developer perspective into your environments. They're just interacting with the Git repo. What about segregation of duty and four eyes principle and all that? Uh, we still have four eyes required to production, of course, and we build that into the release manager as well with, with something that we call global branch restriction rules, meaning that only main branches, can, main branches can be released into production. And of course, then we enforce review on all our main branches. We have some additional requirements of signed commits and status check to complete and all that. And we get that for our infrastructure changes as well, because everything is code which is really nice. And then we get this audit log. This audit log we can present to our audit auditors and we can use that for ourselves, which is really nice. This is just a Git log. Um, so that's a really nice feature as well. And we want to extend this to more than just these Kubernetes native resources with custom resource definitions, which is a concept in Kubernetes. So we can create all our AWS resources using Kubernetes resources and put them into a Git repository and have that reconciled. Instead of having a configuration uh, management tool where you sort of run that tool once and then something happens and you're not uh, getting that state synced back. So we, we want that reconciliation going on for everything that we have so that we are not experiencing drift, uh, which is a really a nice thing too. So you cannot go into AWS, create something and then go back because that's not the desired state you specified and we agreed on, which is a really cool feature. But once you put everything in Git, you of course need to secure your uh, config repository because now that's the source of truth for everything. So use and follow best practices in that regard. Uh, MFA branch protection and all that. I don't have time to go into all the details here. Um, so wrapping it up, I can see I'm shortly running out of time. So did we actually uh, succeed? I think to some extent we did because we, we built a lot of security and we provided a lot of sane defaults for our, our developers and we get all the nice stuff uh, from scanning and all that and, and we deploy around 25 changes in production uh, on average, um, which is a really, I guess, high number for, for a bank. Um, are we there yet? No, there's still a lot of stuff to do, uh, more stuff into Git, we are not completely there. Um, but just highlighting sort of the main things in, in our journey from shifting left. Once you shift left, you need to provide your developers with the sane and uh, secure defaults. You need to make it easy to do the right thing and you need to build security in. And once you now push all of this up to the developer, you need to provide some actionable alerts for the developer to take action on, on the stuff that, that you are now putting, uh, providing their responsibility, and now it's their responsibility. And remember, Kubernetes is not secured by default. You need to secure it. Embrace change. Things change, and banks should too. So that was my presentation. <laughs> you can shoot me an email, or uh, I'm on Twitter if you are, uh, if you want to have some, or if you, if you have some questions afterwards. Great. Thank you so much, Casper. I really appreciate that. Casper, quick question before you leave us, um, you're talking about, you know, people's perception of banks is old, boring and mainframes. 
and you're seen as a disruptor in this sector, correct? Would you say? Yeah, I, I would say that. Yeah. So would you say your ability to manage change and cybersecurity over the next few years, you'll have an advantage because you didn't start at a mainframe stage? You don't have well, a lot of legacy systems or such? Yeah, I, I think we have an, an, an advantage in, in terms of we don't have all those old legacy systems and all these old sort of build up own compliance rules and security rules that you as a company uh, sort of decide is what what practices that you want to follow, right? Yeah. We can be start from scratch and, and, and we are now in, yeah, in the 21st century and, and how do we actually sort of uh, handle that now? Yeah. instead of maybe 20 years ago. Yeah, really interesting. And uh, I'll be very interested to watch the lunar journey. So thank you so much for joining us, Kasper Nisa, and really appreciate your contributions to today. Thank you very much. Thank you.